You're watching Tag TV. And this is the first session this morning. And uh, it's on arts and literature. And we have some amazing panelists here. And Rachna ji, you have taken us to a special place from where uh, there is no elsewhere. So a round of applause for Rachna ji again. In this music, in the midst of the music, there is a silence. Ek thehrav hai. And that is all we seek. Artists and writers have given voice and form to the inaccessible enigma of the Vedic heritage. The timeless lineage has flourished in Americas due to the tireless dedication of these teachers of music, dance, theater, and literature. It is the backbone of what we call our culture. Our songs, our literature, our philosophy, and our day-to-day -day living are grounded in one essential secret that links it all. Raso Vaisaha. Nahi rasadrite kaschidarthaha pravartate. The transcendental reality is experienced as rasa. Until unless there is a shower of blissful delight, no effort can be considered worthwhile. Through the artist, the kalakars, we get connected to the sanatan dhara, the eternal flow. It is this eternal flow of rasa that is the real Ganga. We have a distinguished panel of artists and writers who are the carriers of this rasa parampara. They embody the unbroken lineage that we all aspire to be touched by. Malati Ayengar, a Bharatnatyam dancer, teacher, choreographer, visual artist who has come from LA with her very talented husband, Suresh Ayengar, who is also in the audience and will be displaying his stuff outside. Then we have Phil Goldberg, a scholar, writer, spiritual counselor, meditation teacher, also from the LA area. Then we have Rachna Bodasji, you just heard her, a musician par excellence from San Antonio, Texas. And we have Aditi Banerjee, a writer, scholar, lawyer from New York. And you all uh, uh, heard uh, Aishu Venkat Raman Parikh last night, a musician and a physician from Houston. So we welcome all panelists together. One round of applause for them. So we begin the conversation, the samvad this morning by, uh, I'll address this question to Malati Ayengar. That Malati, what brought you to your art, Bharat Natyam? Were you born in this, with this mission? Or did something else happen? Or did you stumble into it? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, um, Shekharji, for inviting um, me. And thank you, the Thread Conference, for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful event. Thank you. So um, I did not know Bharatanatyam when I was in India. And I, of course, very briefly to share uh, some of my beginnings, I got married at 19 and came to the United States. And, and access to uh, Bharatanatyam was difficult because I came from a village, although my mother so wished that I learned it was just not possible. But um, I come from a family of musicians and visual artists, so that kind of, uh, it was always there in me to pursue at some point, perhaps. But after our daughter Lakshmi was born, when she turned six, she expressed a learn to 
uh, wanting to learn dance. That's when um, I thought this would be uh, something nice for uh, both of us to pursue. And uh, we actually sponsored our guru from Bangalore every year for almost nine years, two times a year, to teach me and uh, my daughter in L.A. So by the time I did my uh, solo dance debut that we uh, familiarly call as Arangetram, I was 38 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> by which time most people quit or move on to other things in life. So uh, I've been very humbled by that experience because I had um, uh, almost all my dance journey has been in the United States although I went back every year to pursue my higher learning from her and, and to stage our work. Um, but my, my growth has been more here. And, um, and, and I have been fortunate, I feel, I went back to UCLA to do my master's in choreography but I, because I felt that that would add another element uh, for me to know how to make my art work for the mainstream audiences. So uh, that's how my journey began. Thank be. you, Malati. Uh, Phil, what brought you to this deep engagement with matters of spirit? Any specific story or anecdote from that era that was a turning point for you? <clears throat> yeah, I was not born in a little village in India. But uh, so my story is different. Uh, I first want to uh, say what an honor it is to be uh, to have been invited, and I thank you for for thinking of me. I I truly think the um, as as someone who has written about the history of uh, Hindu Dharma coming to America, um, the the immigration law of 1965 that made it possible for people from India to come here, I think, is one of the most important events in, in our recent history. So I'm, I'm honored to be part of this. Um, when, when I wrote American Veda, I, I devoted a chapter to the arts uh, because the uh, transmission of uh, the Dharmic teachings from India came uh, in large part or one of the contributing factors was all the artists, especially musicians and authors, who uh, transmitted these, these, this wisdom into uh, terms that Americans could uh, absorb. And I was one of them. When I was a young seeker here, uh, just down the road in Cambridge, really, um, I was... Uh, illuminated in my search for what life is all about by um, the teachings that came from India. So I was reading the Gita and the Upanishads in, in translation, and, and, but I was also educated by some of the great thinkers of uh, Western history from Emerson and then more modern people, Joseph Campbell and Aldous Huxley and Alan Watts and all these people who were absorbing the, the teachings of Vedanta mainly and uh, writing about it in ways that people like me could understand. At the same time, I, was, uh, I always thought I'll become a writer someday, but I, I didn't. <laughs> And then uh, all that searching led me to uh, take up Transcendental Meditation in 1968. And that was a turning point in my life in many ways. And one of the things it did was um, I, had, I had aspired to write ever since I was you know, a teenager, but I wasn't doing it because I was a mess. <laughs> and, and I couldn't even sit still long enough to, you know, write a decent paragraph. And then when I took up TM, it, it changed me. I, I was radically transformed. And so I was able to write coherently. It also gave me something to write about, because I now had a, a, a different frame to understand life and what was going on. And the very first 
paid assignment I had was to write uh, an article about TM for a national magazine. So that, it, it essentially launched my writing career. And ever since, I have been a professional writer. And I frame, because uh, uh, Vedanta and all the, the, the great teachings that came to us from India is how I see the world, it finds its way into most of what I write. Sometimes I get to do it explicitly, like when I wrote American Veda and, and the biography of uh, Yogananda <coughs> that I published last year, but sometimes it's more implicit and it finds its way in, and I like to think I'm sort of trying my best to emulate those authors like J.D. Salinger and Herman Hesse and uh, all the others that I mentioned earlier who uh, were part of this uh, important transmission. Thanks, Phil. Uh, over to Rachna. You were born in a musical family, immersed in rag, taan, alap. Uh, can you share an anecdote from those magical times? Please. And f feel free to actually just uh, uh, communicate, <laughs> express in your own way, in your own idiom, OK? As you already said, that I was yes. born in a family where music was always around. Mm. So initially, my father uh, used to teach me bhajans of famous uh, Pandit Bhimsan Joshi ji, Lata mm. Mangeshkar ji. Mm. And I used to perform everywhere. And then later on, I was always very much mesmerized listening to those taans and alaps of all the artists. Mm. Because all the time we had music going on in my house. My father was a tabla player. Mm. My grandfather was a sitarist. So that way, instrumental music was always there. But vocal, we were always listening mm. to all the artists. So I was like very much attracted to it. And there was a time when I asked my father, I want to sing those taans. Mm. I want to sing such alaps. So my father reached out to my guru. And at the age of 12, mm. I started learning. And uh, I can say that uh, some of the memories which always last in your uh, back of your mind, even if I think I'll be 80 years old or whatever age I'll live, mm -hmm. but that those some of the memories will Please. always uh, be there. So I want to share that. Yeah. The first uh, session with my guru, mm. Pandit Kashinath Buddhaji. I remember I went there and uh, he, used, he was such a fun, uh, loving person hmm. and very, very gentle, very polite. And he said, OK, uh, what we'll do, we'll start with Rag Bhim Palasi. And uh, I'll teach you a Sargam Geet. So Sargam Geet is something which we normally uh, teach to the beginners, hmm. uh, which actually is kind of an introduction to the Rag. It does not have any words, but it has some notes in it. And he said that, okay, I'll tell you a story first, and then I'm going to teach you that Sargam Geet. So at that young age, you are like, oh, story? I was like a little scared initially that uh, <clears throat> how will I be able to like, learn from him because he was such a um, big musician uh, back there. So he said, don't worry, I'll tell you a story, and then we'll start. And just feel at home. It's fine, absolutely fine. So he told me a story, and I would like to share that story with you all. Mm. <clears throat> it's in Rag <clears throat> Bhim Palasi, and uh, it revolves around a bird, long-legged bird, crane, which actually uh, like stands near the shallow water. And that crane bird is uh, actually, it looks that it's in a deep meditation, because normally it stands on one foot, in very deep meditation, you will feel, oh, this bird is like really divine and in a deep meditation. But actually, that bird is very hungry and it's seeking for a food. So, and I'll actually sing. I think it please, will be. Please, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's like in a meditation form, that bird is standing and it's the Sargam Geet thai starts like this. <laughs> Mapaga mare ni sama. Mapaga ma. So here the meditation mode is going on. All of a sudden, that crane, uh, that bird, spots a fish, 
and then as soon as it spots a fish, he just grabs it and swallows it. Okay, so it goes like this. Re ni sa ma ma pa ga ma pa ni sa. So pa ni sa when pa ni sa comes, he spots the fish. Pa ni sa ga re sa ni da pa ma pa ni pa ma ga ma re ni sa ma. Back to the dhyan avastha. <laughs> Beautiful. And then uh, comes the second part. Now here there is a turn in the story. Uh, that bird realizes that uh, it's something disturbing is going on, and I think hunters are hmm. nearby. So that bird decides that this place is may, is may not be safe to stay here. I better go from here. Hmm. So the antra goes like this: Gama pani ni ni pani sa ni sa. So what's going on in here? Gama pani ni ni. This place is not safe. It's better to leave from here and go and land on the other side of the shore. Nisa magare sa nisa. Leave it behind. I have to leave it behind. Nisa magare sa nisa. Ma maga pa pa mani ni pa sa. It goes up in the sky. And then gare sa ni da pa ma pa ni pa maga ma. Other side, he reaches to other side, again lands on the shore, and then back to his meditative uh, state. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> so this was the story, which I always share with my students, and they love it. And uh, yeah. this is a very, very special uh, mm -hmm. uh, story, which I like. I mean, realized I should share it with you. Wow, all. So this is such a you. beautiful way of encoding knowledge. <laughs> and sounds all of it together actually stories and songs carry yeah. the whole culture together thank and you. thank you rachna ji and next uh, i would uh, 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 invite uh, uh, aditi uh, who has done many brave things in life uh, i want you to actually talk uh, about something uh, unusual that you did uh, very unusual recently do you want to share specifically that uh, uh, an anecdote what happened recently and why you chose to do it the way you did. <laughs> okay. That sounds very mysterious. <laughs> I, I think what Shekharji is referring to is I, I got married recently, and uh, actually, <laughs> when, I, um, when, when we spoke a few weeks ago, uh, Shekharji challenged me to, to tie the story of my wedding to the story of the book that I also wrote recently, which I think I, I found a way to, to do so. Um, so I, I wrote a, a novel recently called The Curse of Gandhari about the Mahabharat. And actually the week before my wedding, I had a book tour for this in, in India. Uh, so now to the, the wedding itself, um, I got married in India just three weeks ago. And uh, the place I got married is called Triyugi Narayan. It's a small ancient temple a few hours away from Kedarnath. And uh, to get married there is a bit of a production. So all of us met in Delhi. Then we drove eight hours to Rishikesh, stayed there overnight, and then had a 12-hour drive to Guptakashi, which is the base for, the, for this <coughs> temple. Now, when I say a 12-hour ride, this isn't like a normal drive on the highway. Uh, the monsoons were late this year, so the, the roads were all washed out. And as my cousin called it, it was a Hajmala Drive, meaning it was so bumpy that all the food you've eaten has been, uh, gets digested. <laughs> uh, and so we got there. It's a very remote place. By remote, I mean I didn't have hot water to wash my hair the day of the wedding. Uh, the amenities are very basic. And the question I got is, why here? It's not really a destination wedding in the sense it wasn't luxurious or anything like that. But, but why, why here? Why this particular temple? So that temple is famous because it is the temple where Shiva and Shakti well, got married, Shiva and, and Sati. And actually, when you sit to have the Kanyadan, you're actually sitting where uh, Vishnu, Brahma, all of them were there uh, when Sati was given away to Shiva. And when we did the feras or the circumambulations around the fire, it's actually the same uh, Havankunda where the, the fire of their uh, vivaha from so, many, from so long ago actually took place. So to me, there's no, there's no better place uh, to, to get married. 
And when I explained this to others, some, some people understood it, but some perhaps did not and said, well, you could have chosen a temple in, in Rishikesh or Delhi or even in New Jersey. What's the, <laughs> what's the difference? And the difference is that that story, and from Rachnadi's beautiful example, we see the power of a, of a story. And if you read it about it online, this is described as a myth, that in, in the mythology, Shiva and Sati were, were married here. But to me, that's not mythology. I didn't pick that place and travel for so long to go to someplace that's just a myth or a nice story. It's very real. It's an experiential reality. When you sit there, you feel the presence of Shiva and Shakti and all the, all the devatas. And so this connects to my, to my story because my book, when I go on Amazon, it comes up in two categories. One is myths, legends, and sagas, and then the second is historical fiction. And in my mind, it's really neither of those, uh, because mythology itself, or, or fiction itself, doesn't do service to the reality it has in, in my life, not just as an individual, but as our, as our civilization. And uh, Gandhari also, she's not a Devi, but there is a reality to, to her, or there's something uh, known as the Panchakanya, which are the, the five um, ideal young women, which is uh, Ahalya, Tara, Mandodari from the Ramayan, and then Kunti and Draupadi from the Mahabharat. And there's a popular uh, puja that's recited, uh, it's just a shloka that says, these five women should be remembered every day uh, for, for the rest of time. So that's, that's part of a, a prayer. Uh, it's part of our sacred tradition. It's part of who we are. And so to reduce that as mythology, I think, is, uh, is, is dangerous and not appropriate. And uh, Rajivji, yesterday in his keynote, was talking about Hinduism as being a, a disruptor. And I think one of the things we have to be disruptor for as, as artists and writers is are the categories or, or the, the framework in which we write and do our arts. Because the Western categorization of something as fiction, nonfiction, mythology, or history will never accommodate our storytelling tradition. I think it's true of the arts, too, so I'll, Thank I'll you. it there. Thank you, Aditi. That was beautiful. So now, Aishu, you are a child prodigy and uh, the youngest graduate of uh, Berkeley School of Music at 14, and you've done many other things, but today we are just uh, referring right now as a musician is an artist. So you are surrounded with music, with amazing parents. Your father himself is a, a musician. And uh, so please describe, you know, what is your connection really? What is the parampara? Just, and what is your personal connection that you feel? You know, I've been asked the question, is it nature or is it nurture that makes a musician? And I think the answer to that question ties in to what you're asking me. I'm very, very fortunate, as you mentioned, to, um, to have grown up in a musical family. My paternal grandmother was a violinist, the late Vijayam Ramaswamy. My father is a mridangist. Um, and we're a family of music lovers as well as musicians. My grandmother was actually the first disciple of Padma Bhushan, Sri T. and Krishnan. And I'm the youngest disciple of Padma Bhushan, Shriti, and Krishnan. And so it seems there are many threads <laughs> that, that have connected me to music. And so I think the nature is very clearly there. It's something that's in my blood, something that at least the desire to learn music I was born with. But I think there's something very, very important about having a guru and having a coach. And sometimes those two, those two entities are within the same person, and sometimes those two entities are within multiple people. Guru has a very, very important role in, in, in my life, in, in any musician's life. So my, my many gurus, starting with Sri T and Krishnan, you know, I think uh, the poet Kabir says it best. Loosely translating one of his couplets, he says, Guru and God are both before me, but who do I bow to first? It must be the Guru, because the Guru showed me God. And I very much agree with that. My Gurus have shown me music, and they've shown me, shown me God in that. 
But to become a musician, to perform, to grow that art, there is a very important coaching element. For me, Shriti and Krishnan lived in India. I lived in Long Beach, California, adjacent to where Snoop Dogg you know, grew up and made music. And it was a unique juxtaposition for me to be growing up around rap and pop and to be learning the sacred, sacred art form that's been around for centuries. Uh, Krishna Mama, as I fondly call him, because I don't think I quite learned to pronounce the last N of his name when I was so young, um, would only come to the United States a few months of the year to visit his son, who thankfully lived just a stone's throw from, from where I grew up. And my father and I would take the, in LA traffic, sometimes one and a half hour drive after school to go to these lessons. And, and he would give the amount of knowledge that I think it takes a year or more to learn in just an hour. And that was his, his skill. But the hard part was coming home from the lesson and trying to assimilate this ocean of knowledge that had been, that had been shared in just an hour. And that's where the coaching element came in. And that was very much my father uh, sitting down with these recordings with me, helping me understand the minutia of, of what had been taught. It was also my mother keeping the peace in the home because inevitably my understanding of what my guru had taught me and my father's understanding of what I should be playing didn't always meet eye to eye. It was my you know, sister's job to, here and there, come in with a joke and lighten the mood a little bit. It was very much a, a family-oriented um, drive to, to help me learn music and to help me grow. So I guess I, in the question of was it nature, was it nurture, most scientists these days will say, well, it's a bit of both, because we don't really have, have a perfectly 100% answer for is it one or the other, and I tend to agree with that. I'm grateful that the nature was there, that I was born into a family that decided very early to give me, to give me a violin, and I'm equally lucky to have found a guru who was interested and, and very caring in the way he shared his music with me. And so it's both those things that have made me what I am and will help me grow to what I will be. Great. Thank you, Aishu. So the parampara itself, it doesn't happen automatically. There is conscious effort that is required and diligent tapasya in an ecosystem. So there has to be a context, especially when we are talking about Indian classical arts, music or dance. Once you transplant yourself, let's say from the Indian subcontinent over here, the context is different. The audiences are different the language and the understanding of the symbolism and the stories are often absent here. So Malati, the next question that I have it, uh, for you is that how has your experience of sharing your art with audiences who are unfamiliar with this Vedic or uh, Hindu stories, symbolism, and who are uninitiated in the grammar of classical dance they don't know what Natya or Natya Shastra or any Shastra for that matter is and not even interested. Mm -hmm. So it's not even in don't know, don't know category. They don't even know whether it is worthwhile engaging in this deep endeavor. So give, us, give me, a, you know, and you are a choreographer uh, par excellence. Is there some story or something that you can actually just talk about where you tackled this in some creative way? Um, when I was doing my master's in um, UCLA, I was the guinea pig because they never had any um, graduate students pursuing choreography um, up until then, coming from a traditional background. They only had ballet or modern dance of um, different type of art forms. So when I started to pursue, they brought in um, 
an outside advisor to work with me as a mentor throughout my three years there. But then what I noticed is all the myths and legends that we normally portray in the storytelling, which storytelling is such an essential uh, ingrained part of our system, no matter whether it's music or dance, we are telling stories. Like while you were telling story, I was choreographing in my mind because you made it look so visual and it just seemed very easy to picture the crane and you know the entire scenario. So, uh, but at the same time, we use our face, we use our hand gestures, we use the body language, the angika and the vachika sometimes, you know, to portray what we want to say or how we want to say. For example, when we look at Krishna, we look at Krishna in, in the dance or in any form or in any, any other art form as uh, in three different ways. That has to do with focus a lot. For example, if we are looking at him at an eye level, we are seeking him as a man, as a friend, as someone perhaps a little closer to who we are. Perhaps when we raise our focus a, a little above, there is already a certain sense of something beyond the obvious, something transcending, something divine, something spiritual. And perhaps the moment we draw the focus here, we are looking at the child Krishna. You know, so if we are portraying a song with the ever popular song like Krishna ni Begane Baro, our focus must be Krishna ni Begane Baro. It has to be in this range. It cannot go above. So, but how do we translate that to the mainstream audiences? Do they understand that? So my quest became all through the last, let's say about 25, 30 years, to see how I can draw the imagery to show a child and a mother, Yashoda and Krishna, not go away from the classicism or the tradition of the words that are already embedded so beautifully there, that are written by Vyasaraya so many hundreds of years ago. And how do we communicate that uh, to the audience? So I started to think, perhaps I will try to accomplish both. Meaning, let's say a line is sung, Krishnani Begane Baro, then we would enact that word to word the traditional way, using the hand gestures that are already stylized, that are available, using the facial expressions that we normally do and the body language. But the second time, what if I actually use more of the angika, more of the body language, to demonstrate the activity of a mother and a child, to maybe the, showing the feeding of the child, the playing with the mother and the child. But those type of imagery seem to uh, connect the audience faster. So that told me that I have to retain both. I have to constantly strive to do what, is, what can be understood by everyone, or perhaps what can be understood by those initiated people who are in the audience who might know exactly what I might be doing, who might be just 5 to 10% of the people. So I need both the audience. So that meant that um, anything that I present or perform, I try to do it with two important things in my mind, intent and audience. What is my intent? I would like to show Krishna in three different ways. What is, who is my audience? And how do I translate that? So I like to put myself outside of the box, perhaps think that I'm one of you, and see how I can connect that, the a highest form of aesthetic experience between the perceiver and the performer, the rasa, and build that connection. So whenever I start my work, I try very hard, my very best, to think those two things in my mind, intent and audience, rather than just doing whatever I want to do. Thank you, Malati. That was very nice. Because even in Natya Shastra, any kala, art, is a dialogue between the kalakar and the sahride. And the sahride is the resonating audience. Wherever you are, there has to be a sahride that you are communicating with. Otherwise, there is no art. Even when you are alone, mm -hmm. there is an audience yeah. that you have to be yeah. become aware of. May I just add one quick note? Yes. 
I don't want to take time away from Please. others. But I also learned that giving importance to the core of anything we want to translate mm. or communicate is at most. And draw, coming with a um, foundation of simplicity. You have to be simple. You have to be direct. You have to go to the core. In music, you call that as the Jiva Swaram. You give the impo most importance to the Jiva Swaram. Mm. So you give the, that type of a core importance to the intent of what you want to say. It doesn't matter what you're communicating. Thank you. Um, uh, Phil, as a writer, um, we are challenging you right now that uh, we always, uh, Malati talked about the audience. There is always a reader. Do you think of the reader as your writer? Or is it just a, uh, a, a process of expressing? And so who is that audience or the reader or the world at large that you're trying to communicate with? So is there any anecdote or any story or something? Because you've written uh, this thing. So if you can actually take an example there and uh, speak to that. Yeah. You know, um, when you write, it will depends on the, on the um, genre you're writing in mm -hmm. and the intent. So I've written mostly nonfiction, but I also write fiction. Mm -hmm. And when I write fiction, it's a different set of muscles and um, I think less about the audience. When you write nonfiction and you're communicating an idea or a, a story or an anecdote that illustrates uh, something you want to say, then you have to think more um, explicitly about what the reader will absorb and what they'll get out of it. And I have, frankly, had to rely on editors a lot for that because you lose, it's, it's easy to um, lose sight of w how what you're writing is received. And so I rely a lot on fresh eyes to, to help me with that, to say, you know, is this going to be understood? Is this going to be misconstrued? Is the point being made? Um, and it, it, of course, and in fiction, you don't care that much. You're, you're weaving a story. It's more an act, a, a pure creative act of imagination. Um, although even there, ideas come in. I'm working on a novel now about about uh, a, a young man, American in the '60s, who's brought back from an ashram in India because his of a family crisis, and he has to readapt to life in America. And there, you know, you, you have to make sure the reader understands what you're talking about when you use words like ashram or, you know, whatever. Um, and, and, and frankly, when I write uh, nonfiction uh, uh, and I'm conveying ideas, especially if they're ideas rooted in uh, the, the Dharmic teachings, and I want to make them understood. Mm -hmm. Or when I was writing Yogananda's biography and I wanted uh, people in the West to understand what it would have been like for him to come from Calcutta to, to Boston in mm -hmm. 1920, you have to convey facts, mm -hmm. but in a narrative context. And I always frankly think about uh, people, all the gurus who came here from Vivekananda, Yogananda, Maharshi, Mahesh Yogi, all of them had to find ways to adapt uh, the, what they were conveying to the audience who was hearing this, which is, was different from an audience in India, and how to do that and be without uh, diluting or distorting the teachings themselves. And that's actually been a role model for me because that, that's a skill in, in itself, is to, to adapt without uh, corrupting and, and being understood without diluting what you have to say. And, and that lesson can be applied you know, in many ways to, to the arts. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Phil. That was, uh, as, a, as a writer, as uh, an artist, the way you have to adapt yourself to changing conditions and the context 
is, that is what uh, brings about sometimes magic. It creates a new uh, opportunity. And Rachna, so this is your uh, uh, turn to uh, share something. So you were just transplanted from India, yeah. where you were uh, embedded, immersed in music, and suddenly you came here to North America. Mm -hmm. How did you? How did your practice uh, immediately uh, turn? What was it actually? Just you know, just talk about that particular experience. So when I came to US, um, back in India, I had all the support system and everything because uh, I had a nine-month-old baby with me when we came over here to US. So after coming over here, I was like, uh, how to continue with my. Uh, practice, mm -hmm. because uh, taking responsibilities of my baby and all the household uh, things, um, I just thought that I have to find a way, because during the day, it was difficult. And I used to practice, but the way I wanted, the direction I wanted it to go, it was not uh, going that way. Mm. So I was kind of very disturbed, and then... I just sat down and said, okay, I have to find a way. Mm -hmm. So what I decided <clears throat> that I'll uh, start my practice during night when my baby goes like after dinner when uh, she was almost going to sleep. So I started putting her on my lap and started my practice as a lullaby for her. So <laughs> and uh, to my surprise, mm -hmm. it worked. It worked in such a way that whenever I used to just turn on my tanpura, she, later on she just tells her, okay, it's time to sleep now. So I, <laughs> she was on my lap all the time. When, whenever I practiced during the night time, she was on my lap. And as soon as I turned on my tanpura, I started my alap. Within five minutes, she used to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So that is how I uh, got back to my intensive uh, riyas and everything because I had to take it forward and um, luckily I feel that way my daughter also got used to of that music going around during the day or anything so whenever I used to uh, during the day when, when I used to get time I used to put Tanpura and uh, there were times when I found her sleeping <laughs> in her room while I was practicing because wow. she was I think uh, two uh, years old and uh, she used to play on her own, but uh, at times I used to like practice during the days, turning my tantra, and she was just somewhere nearby. And after a while, I used to realize where has she gone? And then I checked, and she was like uh, sleeping. <laughs> so that is how I coped up with my riyas, and uh, I took my music forward. So I have a uh, follow-up question: Is uh -huh. that you? So when you are singing uh, in front of an audience, uh -huh. do you find generally they fall asleep or? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, what, I, is, what is your goal actually <laughs> when you're performing? <laughs> actually, uh, frankly speaking, when I perform or when I practice, when I sing, uh, my goal is to feel that uh, like dhyan thing, which uh, meditation, which you always want to focus when you practice. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel that uh, when I'm singing in front of audience, I just want them to be there. I try to bring them from wherever their minds, whatever their thoughts are at that moment. I just try to like attract mm -hmm. and bring them to the uh, current where the, the performance or anything is going on. And I feel that classical music is also something which depends how you accept it. A lot of times, if it's in front of children, as with my daughter, mm -hmm. she used to uh, feel that peace, and I think it made her go to sleep. Whereas a lot of people who have <clears throat> some tension or something going on in their mind, I'm sure if they listen to uh, like classical music, it calms them down. So I feel that it's, it's individual. Classical music uh, is individually accepted by everyone. Uh, also, in what mood you are in that uh, moment, a lot of times that also happens. Mm -hmm. So, for me, when I uh, in I'm in front of my audience, I just feel them to be there and uh, enjoy and uh, take them in a different world, 
where they just forget that uh, what is it going on around their life. I just focus on that, try to focus on that. Thank you. In fact, uh, thank you very much. Thank because you. that is the purpose of art, music or art, such as uh, Acharya Abhinav Gupta Kashmir said that, you know, this aesthetic experience itself is like Brahmananda Sahodara Swaroop, mm -hmm. nothing less. Absolutely. So thank you, uh, Rachna. Thank you. And uh, Aditi, uh, you touched upon, you know, your uh, book, uh, The Curse of Gandhari, your latest book. What is the connect between that character from Mahabharat and the current uh, uh, world? What was so urgent and compelling that you had, wrote about the curse of Gandhari? Uh, I, th I think what was uh, what's important about Gandhari is she's neither black nor nor white. Um, I think her her story itself is is fascinating. Um, she, she knows that she's going to be married off to this blind prince who will never be, be king. And she uh, undergoes this really remarkable uh, act of devotion and sacrifice by blindfolding herself uh, so that she will never see what her husband cannot see. Uh, and then there's been so much uh, interpretation and analysis about what does that act represent is it uh, just the act of a devoted wife, or was it some kind of a symbol of defiance or rebellion of someone who couldn't control who she was going to marry? So it was an act of self-martyrdom. And one of the things that, that drove me was to kind of try to rescue her from this, this binary uh, type of categorization. Uh, because I think if you read the Mahabharata, it's very clear that she was devoted, that the sacrifice was genuine, and that's why she has this boon uh, given by Shiva before she blindfolded herself, but then also afterward by Veda Vyasa, that she would bear 100 sons. This is where she has the Tapobala to actually curse Shri Krishna and the like. So there is uh, that genuine um, act of devotion there. But it does, uh, the Mahabharata is never simple, so it raises questions of, what was her dharma as a, as a princess or as a wife to a blind man? Should she have kept her eyesight and kept her full senses so she could be of help to him, so she could be a, a proper queen? And uh, there's an interesting parallel between her and I think Bhishma, who's the other one in the Mahabharata who makes this great sacrifice. And uh, of course, because uh, his, his name itself comes from the fact that he took such a terrible vow and he can control the moment of his death, so it's a very remarkable thing that he did, but I think the Mahaparth also raises the question, was that an appropriate decision for him to make? Uh, he made that decision uh, for his father, uh, who wanted to marry Satyavati so that his father could be happy, but at what price? Because like, actually the entire war could have been avoided had the line of succession continued through him. And the Mahaparth doesn't give a black or white judgmental answer. I think it just tells us when you're undertaking a vow, when you're undertaking a decision or a resolution, you have to consider the entire picture. And there's a lot of gray and, and nuance in, involved. And so I think the Mahabharat itself is very relevant for these times where we live in a very gray kind of world. Um, and I think, therefore, when you read or the, the, the lives of these, uh, these individuals, you can learn a lot from that. Uh, so that was, one of my, uh, that was one of my reasons for, for writing this. Thank you. It's great and quite courageous, actually, because you were just born, grew up here, and you develop such deep insight into the Puranas and, you know, the deep symbolism and the purpose. That's really quite admirable. So, Aishu, um, you are a physician, and uh, uh, you have chosen to uh, explore the connection between music and pediatric neurology. How does it lead to the whole purpose of we are talking about the rasa and generating aesthetic del delight. What is that connection here, you know, between uh, your, not just your research, but your passion in this area? So <clears throat> just as art or, you know, uh, fine arts um, is, well, when I think of a painting, let's say, you paint on a canvas, and you put paints on a canvas, and you create something beautiful. Music, to me, is painting melodies in time. So it's a little bit more abstract when you think of it that way. 
So if your time as a patient is spent in a hospital, painting that time with melodies is something, something that I feel can, can enrich what is perhaps not the, the way you would expect to spend your time. And so I, in medical school, really was exposed to the difficulty of being, um, I saw many children in the hospital setting and it, it really touched me how difficult it is to be a child in a hospital. You have parents making decisions for you. You have doctors telling you what, what the plan is for the day. And as a child, your job is to sit there and to listen. And my question was, how could I use my music to give children a sense of some small sense of control? So I removed my hat of physician or medical student at the time, scientist, and I, I put on the hat of musician. And the goal was to create music in a one-on-one -on -one experience with a one-person audience, which is my pediatric patient, and a one-person artist, just me, with the venue being the patient's bedside. And so this was something we termed musical rounds. And it really opened my eyes to how giving patients the opportunity to speak through music, to share their emotions through music, can be a very enriching experience. One, one memory that I have is of a young girl who um, was suffering from a, a pretty difficult uh, round of chemotherapy in the hospital. And the side effects of the medication had rendered it very painful for her to speak. So her main method of communication was through, she was a young girl, through crayons and paper. And so my time with her was mainly walking in, trying to sense how the day may have been for her, which on, for the most part was not you know, many good days for her. And I attempted to just play the music that would express what emotions she may have been feeling. So she would draw, she would write words, she would paint on her canvas while I painted on mine. And over time, with many patients and many of these encounters, we recorded all of them, and we were able to create a, a product of music that I feel encompassed the many ranges of emotions that were felt in the hospital by many number of patients. And so I think music can be a very wonderful way, especially the music of India is rag based, ragam based, and therefore it is a good translation for emotions. We have so many ragams and there are so many emotions. And while there may not be a one-to-one -one correlation, there is a beautiful uh, a synergy between emotions and ragams. And it's a way that we, as musicians, can express ourselves. And it's a way that we can allow those who may not play music to share their expressions as well. So I think as a musician, my role is to try and understand my audience and create music that shares what they may be feeling, not just my own emotions, but the emotions of those that are listening. Thank you, Aishu. That was so amazing and <laughs> insightful. In fact, this is a, uh, a DVD that has been uh, produced by uh, Aishu and her uh, a team, which captures what uh, she just mentioned, revival. And you can actually speak to her about it uh, uh, subsequently. And uh, we, I want to open the floor for any questions. If you have any questions, please write it down or, uh, uh, and uh, give it to Ram. And uh, uh, we have only uh, 10 minutes here right now. But please, actually, if you have a quick question, um, uh, please uh, uh, write it down. Or if you can share it very cryptically, please, you know, no long comments or anything. If you can actually just sum up your question in 10 seconds, then you can actually just uh, speak it, share it also. And uh, uh, while you are doing so, collecting your questions, um, okay. We already have a question. 
Um, so please, actually, just you know, uh, subsequently, uh, uh, more questions I would like to collect and then uh, uh, ask the panelists. In the meantime, I have a general question for the panel also, is that the idea of stage performance or art, performing art itself is a limitation, that it only happens on a stage. The original idea, perhaps, was that life itself is the stage and we are performing all the time. So becoming acutely aware of where we are, what we are doing. And that's where the purpose was of art was, where mundane becomes sacred and the ordinary becomes extraordinary, just by paying attention to something that is very common. And that was the whole idea when I mentioned, started out the, the Vedic enigma, through paying that conscious attention that the cosmic drama is revealed. So what can be done, I'm just opening it up, that what can be done to ensure that that parampara, that ideal, continues to flourish or perhaps can flourish in future? Just want to open it up. Um, okay, <laughs> I, I feel one must be trained in the foundation really well in order to explore or to even, even imagine that some other things might be possible based on that. If there is no foundation, uh, whether it is uh, visual art or music or dance, I don't think anything is possible. Because in my, uh, I'm just going to read two quick lines that this is how I feel about the classical art forms. We are in, the, in a world where the daily obsession seems to be what's new and what's next. It's easy to become very distracted by this. I feel it's important for me to be grounded in the traditional before I think of new ways of presenting anything. To me, it's rare and a welcome reminder that true classical art is timeless. So I give all my, um, humbly, all my gratitude to the foundation of that is where everything lies, the life-giving source. Unless we go deep into it and learn properly, I don't think anything else is possible. Thank you. Malati. I have another question. And I want to open it up, but I'll actually just ask uh, uh, Aishu, you in your training itself, did you do a lot of it through Skype or internet? Or uh, just, just asking you actually that question. So my question is that can the rasa be transmitted through that you know, digital uh, 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 medium or through the internet? Or does it require physical presence? A lot of it probably you learned electronically also. So I just want you to comment on that. In my early years, I was fortunate to learn one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, two feet away from, from Krishna and Krishnan. And there's something irreplaceable about that experience. Hmm. To, to very clearly see how his face is responding to what I've played, whether it's uncertainty as to whether I practiced enough or a pleasant surprise that I was able to actually play what I intended on playing. There's something about seeing the feedback of a, of a guru in real time, right in front of you, that changes the way you learn. That said, I fully agree that the foundation is built on that and the foundation is so important. Once that initial foundation has been built, I think a great deal of learning can be done by watching YouTube videos, by seeing the greats who may not be with us anymore, but whose legacy has been sustained by video recordings that have now been collected for posterity. There's a great deal of learning that can be done that way. That a guru can continue to impart a vast amount of knowledge through the medium of Skype. Would that completely replace the, the emotional aspect and the beauty of a one-on-one -on -one experience? Perhaps not. But am I immensely grateful for technology moving forward and allowing me to continue to learn when I live miles and miles and miles away from my gurus? Absolutely. Thank you. 
So uh, there's one other uh, audience question. Is that the social media changing the sensibility of people? And also, of course, you know, the attention span and what you have to deliver in that uh, uh, nano uh, time unit to them to gratify their uh, sensibility also. What is it doing to that uh, the aesthetic experience itself when we are talking of a eternal, uh, a oceanic, uh, blissful experience? What is it really just, how is it uh, uh, doing it? I don't know who uh, want to actually fill. Do you want to actually just take that? Well, <clears throat> I deal in, in written word and uh, social media, electro digital age has just changed the means of transmission. Uh, but it is a, a vital factor. Uh, one of the things that, um, one of the ways in which it's affected the transmission of uh, written word from author to reader is um, it's so easy to be published now and to reach to, to get your uh, material online, that there, one of the dangers is the curate, we lose the curator, we lose the editor. There's so much bad writing, <laughs> to be honest, that is uh, available now because, in, you know, traditionally writers had professional editors to work with before something goes out to the mm -hmm. public. Now you can just spew it out. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's a danger, balanced by the fact that voices are heard now that could never be heard before, and, and, it, and more quickly than ever before. And I, I want to, if I may, just go back to the earlier question and put in a word for sadhana. Um, the, the, any artist is, no matter how well trained, is uh, conveying his or her state of consciousness onto or into what they produce. And to the extent to which uh, an audience will be receptive and transformed in the process will have to do with the consciousness that the writer or artist brings to the work, mm -hmm. and, and so and one of the great um, um, blessings of the Dharmic teachings coming here is it has taught people like me the importance of the subjective uh, inner state of, of being that is brought to the work. Thank you, uh, Phil. So we have uh, limited time, but quickly, if I can actually just have some short uh, responses. One question is that in art, Rachnaji, if you can actually just answer this uh, also, is that uh, one can get carried away in the technical gymnastics of the art versus the aesthetic experience that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the sensibility is changing, as we already discussed. But how do you balance that? Because you have to show your technical prowess also with fast dance, and there's that <laughs> lot of acrobatics. And juxtaposed also with uh, uh, the melodious, the aesthetic uh, uh, delivery that mm -hmm. you want uh, uh, to uh, convey. Um, I feel uh, the real motive behind like classical music. Mm -hmm. It is kind of to uh, bring everyone, as I told earlier, that to bring them in a world where they just forget everything else. So that definitely comes with the, uh, the slow alap and the initial introduction of the rag. And uh, I feel like uh, any rag when we perform, uh, it's like a bud and it's it's an opening flower mm -hmm. one petal at a time mm -hmm. and slowly uh, when we reach towards the tanas and uh, mm -hmm. the George Jhala and whatever like in instrumental music in the vocals when we re reach to the tan bol tan and everything that is the full blossom of that flower when that flower blossoms how beautiful it looks mm -hmm. and when it's a bud then also it looks beautiful but I feel like that any presentation